Good afternoon. This is the Thurston County Board of Health for uh, April 10th, 2018. I'm Commissioner Bud Blake, chair of the board this year. I'd like to start off by doing introductions. Um, to my left is Commissioner Gary Edwards. To my right is Commissioner John Hutchins. His right is Lydia Hopkinson, the clerk of the board. And to her right is the Director of Public Health and Social Services, Shelley Slaughter. And to her right is Dr. Wood. She is the health officer for Lewis and Thurston County. And to her right is Ramirez Chavez, the county manager. With that in mind, I ask the board if there is a um, uh, approval to uh, the agenda. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the agenda for April 10, 2018. Second. It's been moved and second to approve the agenda for April 10, 2018. All those in favor say aye. Aye. And that motion carries. Aye, and that motion carries. And now with the meeting, meeting minutes for March 13, 2018 and the work session summaries for March 6, 2018. Okay, there we go. Mike is on. So the approval for the meeting minutes for March 13, 2018. And the work session summary for March 6, 2018 and March 13, 2018. I uh, move to approve the meeting minutes from March 13, 2018, acceptance of the work session summaries from March 6th and March 13th, 2018. Second. Sec moved and second as stated. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that motion carries as well. So we have a very packed agenda today for the Board of Health, and we have several proclamations that we're going to get through, and it's absolutely exciting to be able to touch on some of these, all surrounding um, one public health issue or another. And the first one we have today is the Proclamation for Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. I'm going to ask uh, Director Shelley Slaughter to kind of uh, give us a little bit of background, and we'll have the guests come forward and be able to re uh, speak and receive the proclamation. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Today, on behalf of Thurston County Public Health, Thurston Thrive, and our many community partners who are here today, I'm here to ask the Board of Health to join with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and thousands of others across the country to proclaim April Child Abuse and Neglect Awareness Month. Unfortunately, one in four children across our country experience child abuse and neglect. And in our community, kids experience that at a higher rate than many other kids in our state. We rank eighth in adverse childhood experiences that is one of the highest in Washington. Child abuse and neglect is on the rise, but we can prevent it by promoting protective factors and by supporting the many amazing nonprofits and professionals we, are, we have here that are working hard every day to prevent child abuse and neglect. Thurston Thrive's Education Youth Resiliency and Action Team works together to ensure that we live in a community where all children of all cultures are healthy, safe, valued, and successful. Today, we have two members of the team that are here to tell you about the amazing work that they do in the community to help prevent child abuse and neglect, and they'll accept their proclamation today on behalf of the rest of the action team. So I'd like to invite up to the podium Trish Gregory from Family Support Center of South Sound, uh, Natalie Scovern from Family Support Center of South Sound, and Shelley Willis of Family Education and Support Services. And they're going to tell us a little bit about what they do. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hello, Natalie. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Um, so I'm standing in for Trish Gregory, who is homesick today. So on behalf of Family Support Center, we just want to thank the board and our community um, for your support of our programs and services, and the Family Support Center is working every day to strengthen all families in our community. Um, and we do it alongside many of our community partners, so I want to thank you, and I will turn it over to Shelley Willis. Thank you. Hello, council Hello. members. Hello, Shelley. On behalf of Family Education and Support Services and the over 7,000 families we serve annually, thank you for recognizing child abuse prevention efforts through this proclamation. There is no one solution to keeping kids safe. It truly takes a village for all of us doing all we can to help kids grow in healthy environments. Each year, FEST partners with several community uh, folks to plant over 1,000 pinwheels at the state capitol. They're currently on display right now through the end of this month. We also provide a wide array of family strengthening programs, such as our Parenting Tools presentation that will take place on April 24th in collaboration with South Puget Sound Community College and featuring Emily McMason. It's a free event. I hope everybody will join us. And because the pinwheel represents the happy, healthy childhood every child deserves, I brought a few of you to have on, on hand to share with others, and maybe it will prompt some conversations I see Hutch has his from last year. I'll make sure all of you have one. Thank you. I think you. he stole mine. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. 
show a real low. Do it again. I have one on my lapel. Does that count? It counts. Okay, that's okay. good. I don't know where to stick it. There we go. Ah. Okay. Oh, you got to come back out. We're not done with you. Yeah, come back. Come back. Come back. We got questions. Doing. We did take pinwheel delivery, but we had questions. Natalie? Do you have a question for the. I don't know. No. <laughs> Thank you, Shelly. I don't. Oh, okay. No, no comment. Uh, I, have a, I have a comment. Okay, what's uh, your comment then? What you do? I guess anytime we're dealing with young people, you know, they're, I, I don't want to be old hat around here, but I, I say this quite often because I think it is so important that youth are 30% of our population, but they're 100% of our future. And if we don't get this right with young people, get them on the right track, uh, I think we're really missing the boat, so to speak. And uh, I don't know if, for those of us maybe that haven't had the experiences that some of the young people, when we refer to ACEs and such, uh, they, I just I think it is so crucial that we prioritize recognizing anything that we can do to benefit kids as they're growing up, because they are our future. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. That's very nice to hear from an elected official. Thank you. Uh, and parents, whether there's one parent or two parents or more, we only get one shot at raising a child. You can't hit the pause button. Nope. You can't hit rewind. Mm -hmm. You don't get a do-over. You don't get a King's X. We get one shot at it. Um, and oftentimes it, it um, doesn't work out. And it's very difficult to go back and kind of correct it. But it can be corrected. So uh, I really appreciate the work that, that you folks are doing as well and uh, in bringing this, again, continually to the, to the forefront in people's minds. Thank you. Sure. And I would like to exercise, exercise the chair's prerogative, and I see Gretchen in the audience, and if I could ask her just to talk a, a one second or one minute on child prevention and this whole scheme of what you're all, you're, you two organizations represent. I see Gretchen and Liz. Okay. Yep, Liz too. Okay, Liz, you're on the hot seat along the direction. Liz. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I'll try to keep it to one second. Okay. So um, just I would like to say thank you for bringing attention to this and that with our maternal child health work, both in Nurse Family Partnership and Children with Special Health Care Needs, it allows the opportunity, just like with Family Support Center and with Family Education Support Services, to work with parents on helping them to have a better understanding of their child's social emotional needs, their, how their baby's developing, and how they can be the, you know, the best parent and the best teacher um, they can be with their child. With Nurse Family Partnership, um, our research shows a 48% reduction in child abuse and neglect for the population we're serving. And that comes from the partnership and the relationship that we develop with the parents and um, just supporting them with with resources and and helping them understand their baby i just want to thank all of you for your support and for being such active participants in the community not only you know you talk about children and families but you're actively at the table with all of us community partners and making a difference and i just want to thank you very much for that all, all three of y'all are out, outstanding and amazing what you do in terms of prevention and taking care of the children and the mamas out there. We go to bed and wake up every morning trying to figure out how we can be there with you all in that same caliber because y'all bring happiness to the, this community that we can never do, but we're there with you 100%. Know, that, know that, that we're doing that for you. So thank you, too, so very much. So. Well, and we him, feel that, and it, makes, it really makes a difference in the work. You bet. We appreciate so he's going to read the proclamation now. In, in 35 years of cop work, I had a ton of fun. But the toughest duty, but somewhat rewarding, was the three years in the, the late 80s when I was a uh, children's crime detective. Uh, and it was exceedingly tough, exceedingly tough, but exceptionally rewarding in putting bad people away. Not people I'm mad at, but people that deserve to go to prison. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month. Whereas the future of Thurston County rests in the hands of one of our most vulnerable and cherished assets, our children. And whereas since 2010, 
Thurston County has continued to experience an increased rate of child abuse and neglect that has come to the attention of the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services. And whereas child abuse continues to be one of our nation's most serious public health problems, and Thurston County has the eighth highest rate of adverse childhood experience scores in Washington State, and whereas our communities are stronger when all citizens are engaged in preventing child maltreatment and are involved in supporting families to provide safe, nurturing environments for their children, which will give them the opportunity to become caring, contributing members of their communities, and whereas the Thurston Thrive's Education and Resilience Action Team is collaboratively working with community organizers to bring attention to domestic violence in our community and to identify preventative measures to reduce harm to children. And whereas we, the, the, as Thurston County residents, continue our commitment to protecting all members of our community and call upon citizens to join together to increase public safety and prevent further abuse and neglect of our children. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Thurston County Board of Health proclaims April 2018 as Child Abuse Prevention and Awareness Month in Thurston County and calls upon all citizens, communities, state agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, elected leaders, and businesses to increase our participation in efforts to support families and thereby preventing uh, child abuse and strengthening the community in which we live adopted this 10th day of April 2018, signed by your Board of Health. It's exciting, action packed today. We have another one, another proclamation we'd like to go through, and that would be the sexual assault awareness. And I'm going to ask Shelley to uh, give us a little bit more background on that, also. Sure. In addition to being Child Abuse and Neglect Awareness Month, which uses the t color teal to raise awareness, Sexual Assault Awareness Month also uses that same color. And so I'm here to ask the Board of Health today to proclaim April Sexual Assault Awareness Month and to join others throughout the country um, in observing this day to raise, or this month, excuse me, to raise public awareness about sexual violence and educate communities on how we can prevent it. Um, this year, we're celebrating the 17th anniversary and the theme is Embrace Your Voice, to inform individuals on how they can use their words to promote safety, respect, and equality to stop sexual violence before it happens. Individuals can embrace their voices to show their support for survivors, stand up to victim blaming, shut down rape jokes, correct harmful misconceptions, promote everyday consent, and practice healthy communication and relationships with our children. We know that one month is not enough to solve this serious and widespread issue of sexual violence. One in five of every woman experience sexual violence in their lifetime. So if you look around the room or think of who you have in your family, someone has been affected in our community by this. The attention that April generates is an opportunity to energize and expand prevention efforts throughout the year. With the country focused on this very important issue, we have an unprecedented opportunity to, pr to improve understanding and change behaviors. And today we have many amazing local providers and community partners with us uh, to share a little bit about what they do to prevent uh, and support survivors of sexual violence. And so I'd like to invite up to the podium to share a little bit about what they do and accept the proclamation. And so we have Sarah Lloyd, who's executive director of Safe Place. 
and April, is April here as well? In April, can come on up too. Joyce Gilbert, Medical Director of the Sexual Assault Clinic and Child Maltreatment Center at Providence St. Peter Hospital. And Tina Olson, is Tina here too? Okay. Yeah. Tina Olson from Providence St. Peter. So welcome, thank you. Yay. Please come thank to the podium. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, it's good to see you again, Sarah. Hi, I haven't yeah, seen tell you us in about like 24 hours. So, um, <laughs> yeah, we were I am time. Sarah Lloyd. <laughs> Um, and I'm the Executive Director of Safe Place, and Shelly, thank you for sharing some of those statistics. What we're seeing in our community and across the country is that there's an increase in events of sexual assault. Um, we're fortunate in these days that um, the climate has shifted and changed to a more open um, dialogue about these events happening, things like Me Too and the movement in that, though it has shifted and changed in its mission and the um, reputability of what's happening, the reality is that there are people who are way more willing to have the conversation. In addition, what we're seeing in our community is there's a huge rise. So um, this year, uh, in the past year, Safe Place served 316 individuals who reported experiencing sexual assault, and 20% of those were children. And that is a 23% increase from the year before. So um, it's hard in this work, right, to understand if that's an increase of events if our community is becoming more safe for people to actually report, sexual assault is often the most underreported crime that happens. But what we do know is that more people need services and more people need access to resources and support. So we're so thankful um, for you all and your support in, in supporting survivors in our community and making sure that we have a community that's responsive in trauma-informed ways to helping people walk through that process. It's not just reporting, it's everything that happens after reporting that they walk through. And so the more responsive we can be, the better. Um, it's important also to know, so the statistic, the updated statistic is one in three women experience sexual assault and one in four men. So we also have to have broaden the conversation about the fact that men are survivors in this space too, and how do we continue to be responsive and supportive for survivors that are walking through that space. So you all and your support have been instrumental in that, and I thank you for supporting Safe Place and moving forward successfully. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, very good. April, would you like to speak? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have more to add, but Sarah's already <laughs> well, shared. <laughs> So Tell us about Safe Place. <laughs> Brag about Safe Place. For well, a I guess one yeah, thing so. that I could share, uh, we have a sexual assault support group that last year we had started doing. Um, this year we have seen a huge increase in um, people coming forward and wanting to join our support group. Last year our numbers were very low. This year we have wait lists to get in. Um, and that might go back to what Sarah was talking about. Maybe there's an increase in crimes or maybe people... Um, because of things like the Me Too movement, um, are more willing to come forward and talk about it and seek services. And um, I think the more people talk about it, the less stigma there is. So. And on September 14th is the gala, if I have that correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. so. I'm glad that you know join us. Yeah. Join us. We'd love to have you. You bet. Okay, thank you. Dear. Thank you. You bet. And Hi, I'm Tina, Tina Olson from the Sexual Assault Clinic. Go ahead. Um, we unfortunately have seen over 300 kids in the past year, but um, those children are getting amazing support at our clinic in a child-friendly environment. And we're really focusing on doing more education in the community, and particularly with educators, to be, be able to identify children that may be at risk or um, are showing signs of sexual abuse. So we are hopeful that we can make a big difference with education and prevention in our community. Mm. Any comments or questions for any of the three? Thank you all for all your very important work. It's unbelievable. Sarah, you said one out of three women? In their life. In my immediate family, two out of two adult women, and they were both in the workplace. Yeah. And my thought was, and these idiots know what I do for a living? <laughs> it made no sense. So thank you very much. Uh, would you like to read the proclamation? If I can. But if you can, <laughs> okay. Whereas sexual assault, no, I'm sorry, sexual violence is a broad term and includes rape, incest, child sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, sexual exploitation, human trafficking, unwanted sexual contact, sexual harassment, and other acts when someone is forced or manipulated into unwanted sexual activity or experience without their consent, and whereas sexual violence 
is a serious preventable public health problem that affects millions of people each year, including children, teens, adults, and seniors in our community who live, work, uh, who live with, work with, and care about. And whereas sexual violence is highly prevalent, with approximately one in five women and one in 67 men experiencing rape or attempted rape in their lifetime in the United States, and whereas minority and marginalized people are disproportionately impacted by sexual violence, with one in three women of color and nearly half of all LGBTQ people experiencing sexual assault in their lifetime, and whereas by the senior year, their senior year in high school, one in three girls and one in seven boys were sexually assaulted in Thurston County. Sexual abuse is an adverse childhood experience which impacts the health, safety, and well-being of children for their entire lives, increasing their risk of re-victimization and other types of abuse. And whereas survivors of sexual violence suffer from physical and psychological damage throughout their lifetime, with significantly increased risk of chronic disease and medical conditions such as obesity, heart disease, chronic pain, gastrointestinal intestinal illness, reproductive problems, sexually transmitted diseases, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, drug and alcohol abuse, suicide, divorce, job absenteeism, academic failure, and financial difficulties. And whereas our community promotes sexual violence prevention efforts and healing services for survivors of sexual assault, by supporting community partners such as Safe Place, Monarch, Partners in Prevention Education, CLO Project, YWCA, Family Support Center of South Sound, and Providence St. Peter Sexual Assault Clinic. And whereas we can prevent sexual assault by changing social norms that accept and tolerate violence against others through education, conversations, programs and policies that promote healthy relationship skills and behaviors starting in youth uh, provide opportunities to empower and support girls and women, mobilize men and boys as allies, address oppression and sexual harassment when confronted by it, create protective, protective and equitable learning, working and living environments, hold perpetrators of sexual violence accountable, and support and believe all survivors. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Thurston County Board of Health is committed to promoting safety, respect, and equality for everyone, and does hereby proclaim April 2018 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and urges all citizens to make the prevention of sexual violence a paramount priority in our community. Adopted this 10th day of April 2018, signed by your Board of Health. Okay, we have one more excellent proclamation to go through, and I'll do the introduction on this one. Oh, I thought you were plugging <laughs> no, the cord there. Um, the next proclamation is absolutely wonderful to be able to present because here in Thurston County we have an initiative, initiative called Thurston Thrives, and it comes with a coordinating council of about 21 people. And so um, I'm going to let Chris Hawkins uh, take it from here and give the uh, rest of it, huh? Good afternoon, Commissioners, and thank you very much for recognizing Public Health Month here in Thurston County. Um, with this proclamation, you're recognizing some important efforts that Thurston County has made over the last couple of years. Yep. 
I'm Chris Hawkins, the manager for community engagement, evidence, and partnerships with the health department. And um, today we have with us uh, David Shaffert, the president and CEO of the Thurston County Chamber Foundation, which has been providing the uh, support sort of backbone for the Thurston Thrives public-private partnership working on health improvement here in our community, which is responsible for a lot of the, the good results that we're seeing in some uh, national rankings of our county in terms of its healthiness. Yeah, it has. Um, David is joined by the chair of the uh, chamber's board, and, and that is Joanna West. So I'll invite them up here now to, to speak with you a little bit more about um, public health. Thank you. Yay. Hello, David and Joanna. Hello, David. Good afternoon. Joanna, nice to see you again. Board of Health and, and Commissioners, and thank you, Chris, for the introduction and, and everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing us to be here today. I took the liberty of inviting my boss, Joanna Wess, uh, who chairs both the foundation and the Chamber Board of Trustees. Uh, and I'll, I'll let her share a little bit, uh, some thoughts about the, the uh, chamber support for Thurston Thrives. But the thank you goes to the county and its staff. Um, and it's, uh, there's a uniqueness in, in this graciousness in that it, it follows your predecessors and then flows through your commitment and your staff's commitment at looking at health differently in our community. It's pretty exciting when you take a look at our, is what you, you're doing actually having impact? And when, you're, when you start looking at your rankings with fellow counties and how you've moved up, that's exciting affirmation. When you take a look at Aetna Foundation, the US News and World Report, in reinforcing what is occurring in our community, we're now in the top 8% of 500 counties across our nation. That is exciting. Well, numbers aren't the reason why we get excited. It's about how we impact people's lives, and uh, that is really important. Uh, if you look at government, uh, in my opinion, there's no greater thing than a government entity can do is the, the safeguard of one's citizens' lives and trying to make a quality life by living a long and healthier life. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joanna, and then I will just wrap up with uh, one other quick comment. So Joanna. Hello, Joanna. So, oh, thank you. Um, the Chamber Foundation leadership is very supportive in being the backbone organization of Thirst and Thrives. It is the Chamber Foundation's commitment to continue our support of the initiative to continue the momentum in making Thurston County a healthier community. We thank you for this recognition and are proud of the work that our community has done together to improve our community's health ranking. Um, the foundation, like I said, is pleased to be the supportive agency of Thurston Thrives, but it really follows what the chamber's mission, too, is, is to really have a healthy place to live, work, and play. So I know that the entire chamber is supportive of Thurston Thrives in this initiative. So since it's uh, such a rare opportunity, I get to have a microphone in front of my face. I did want to also share uh, how unique it's been for me to chair the coordinating council over the past several years. Uh, and watch how our community and the hundreds of individuals and organizations are, think about how they provide services differently in our community. The collective impact model asks that we align resources and thoughts for measurable outcomes. And uh, I think the entire community should be proud of its efforts. Uh, there's no amount of resources on earth that can fix some of the challenges we have in, in, in health. It, they are solved through uh, collective efforts of a community, and we are seeing that today. So again, thank you uh, for your ongoing commitment and uh, your support of Thurston Thrives and all the action teams and all the individuals and all the organizations. It is most appreciated. Okay. So we have questions and comments. Hang on. Oh, I'm going to look forward to a picture here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm looking for a picture. <laughs> it's one thing for us to support it, but it's another thing for Thurston Thrives and the Chamber and all the individuals, businesses, and trumpeters, everybody that's behind all these initiatives and the hard work everybody behind the scenes is doing and the community just doesn't know. But they, uh, they benefit greatly from it. So thank you and, and everybody that does this work. 
You're welcome. Thank yeah, you. just my comment. I love Thurston Thrive. I think it's absolutely wonderful. It's one of the few counties that uh, actually um, have the forward thought of doing this. I know Spokane kind of does it, a couple in California and what have you, but it sprinkles across the nation, to be quite honest with you, and how um, uh, we do it here, and we do it well. I won't say anything um, too much, but I'll put in a plug for the housing action team. I think they're the best, and so uh, we'll just leave it at that. So, <laughs> so. You can't help yourself, can you? Sorry? You can't help yourself. No, I can't. I gotta take advantage. But we'll do a picture now. Yeah. So. Okay. I don't have to read it. Oh, read it? Oh, you wanna read it? No, I don't want to. I don't know how it's I gotta read the proclamation, my bad. I jumped Gary wanted the photo. <laughs> Gary did it to me. Go ahead. Please read the proclamation. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Whereas. Yeah. Since 1995, the American Public Health Association has sponsored National Public Health Week to educate the public, policymakers, and public health professionals, and whereas the top 10 causes of death in Thurston County are related to preventable conditions, modifiable behaviors, and the community environment, and whereas the Thurston County uh, is among the top 10 healthiest Washington State counties, improving to number or sixth place this year in the annual county health rankings of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and whereas April 2018 marks the fifth anniversary of Thurston Thrives, our county's partnership among public and private groups that engages the community and fosters collaborative collaboration to build health into our everyday lives, and whereas Thurston Thrives action teams and work groups are making a difference by creating better access to healthier foods and places to be active, protecting water quality, creating affordable housing, promoting clean air and stable climate, helping families increase resilience, reducing adverse childhood experiences, protecting public health and better connecting our local communities, and where Thurston thrives and its many partners are working together to keep our community healthy and continue to work towards the healthiest community possible. And whereas April 2nd through the 8th, 2018, is National Public Health Week, and American Public Health Association urges everyone to rally around a, global, a goal of making the U.S. the healthiest nation in one generation by 2030. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the county, Thurston County Board of Health uh, hereby proclaims April 2018 as Public Health Month in Thurston County and urges all citizens to join in this special observance to take action toward a goal of making our community, state, and nation the healthiest we can be and invites all county residents to volunteer taking care of people and places and shaping the plans and policies in our community so that Thurston thrives. Adopted this 10th day of April 2018, signed by your Board of Health. So if I get Liz, Chris, Shelly, you're in here for Thurston Thrives also. Go on. Yes, so. and we can have all public health employees oh, yeah, who are public health. Sure. also kind of our unsung heroes that do great work and are such an important part of this partnership. Come on up. That's almost everybody in this room, I think. <laughs> Okay. Joanna. So.
So that moves us into our other portion of the agenda, which is the uh, opportunity for the public to address the board. And I just see if I have anybody that signed in so I can check them off. There's a subject too. <laughs> it's okay. Give me one second to get it out. I think Chris is bringing up a um, slideshow anyway. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All the logistics, coordination, and choreography need to make a sure. Yes. There it is. Okay, sure. So uh, here's how the kind of how we do things. Uh, you have the counter three minutes up there, or okay. So three minutes is going to appear up here in just a second, and I uh, do it by first come first serve. Those who signed in, and when you come to the podium, I ask you to just kind of state your name and where you're generally from in the county. And when the three minutes counts down, it kind of gives this kind of microwave pop or sound like uh, you're done. But you continue to thought. If you're midstream or mid thought of that sound, I want you to finish everything because we believe in hearing you. And so, um, um, but we'll, we'll get you through it. So uh, the first person I have is Sue Bill. Hi, Sue. Come on up. It's good to see you. That's Hi, my name is Sue Beal, and I'm the director for um, Providence. Can you pull your mic down just a test so we can catch all of what you're saying? There you go. Better. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. For Providence Behavioral Health, and uh, one of my program is, programs is the Providence Community Care Center, which is in downtown Olympia. And the center brings together already existing organizations to work collaboratively and provide a single point of, point of access for vulnerable individuals, connecting them with basic basic building blocks of healthy living, food and shelter, mental and physical health care. Um, and I just wanted to give an update on uh, where we are with the Community Care Center. We're going to be open about seven months this week. Um, and we have an average number of guests come in, uh, about 177 per day. And Providence and Behavioral Health Resources average about 48 behavioral health consults weekly. Um, we have sidewalk that's there. 125 individuals have been housed. And 675 have been enrolled in housing. And this number represents individuals with a lower vulnerability um, score. So, and the average number of showers is about 39. Uh -huh. So, um, we do have several agencies who um, are there. Of course, Providence providing mental health substance abuse services, Interfaith, Sidewalk, the Olympia Free Clinic, uh, CMAR Community Health Centers, Behavioral Health Resources, Capital Recovery Center, Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization, uh, Thurston Mason National Alliance on Mental Illness, the Community Youth Services, Home and Community Services, Safe Place, Housing and Essential Needs Program, the VA Med Clinic, and uh, Covenant Creatures who come in and bring dog supplies and help out with the pets. So um, I wanted to just give um, an update on some challenges that we have. And um, People do come down the street when they're coming into work and they see the community care center on Franklin and 4th Avenue and often people are queuing up to come in or there are encampments there. So we have hired a security officer who comes at 5 p.m. until 1 in the morning and um, this security officer is there to clear the, the site so that we don't have camping going on there. Um, also, we're working with OPD. If there's any drug dealing going on, um, they're helping out with that. And uh, we still have some queuing up in the morning. People bring their tarps and, and stand on the sidewalk. So it does look like people are camping there in the morning, but they, they haven't been there all night. Continue. Continue. So, yeah. so the city of Olympia is committed to bring in a trash compactor, um, and it should be ready to be installed this summer. City of Olympia, of Olympia will be adding high definition cameras to the back alley so we can watch um, more and we'll be adding some lighting to the back alley. We're adding fencing around the transformers. Um, we have the clean team coming and focusing on our efforts and the Olympia Ambassador Program has agreed to start their patrols at 8 a.m. 
We're also going to be putting some uh, window coverings up also. So there is some work being done to, to clean it up. Oh, yeah, we have questions and comments. Uh, yeah, I don't think we got Sue in the right place on the agenda, because I don't think she ought to be limited to no, oh, no. Can Can she give us a little more? You seem yeah. like you're pressed for time. and You have more to say? Very sure. good work. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we're not in a hurry. Okay. okay. Well, I could give a guest uh, success story just so you get an idea sure. of what what exactly. we are doing because there are a lot of really great things happening yep. inside. And we have a lot of uh, organizations who are coming to the table to asking if they can come and provide services yep. there. The, at the floor is yours. Keep, keep going. Yeah. So, um, um, so a quick guest story is um, the kind of work that we're doing at the Community Care S Center. This, this gives an opportunity to share that. So we have um, a 30-something guest who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. He'd been living on the streets for over a year after early, earlier stays at adult family homes. He seemed to keep to about four or five block area when we first encountered, encountered him last summer. He's a taller guy who, when responding to internal stimuli, makes wild gestures and uses loud, profound language. He was present around our building long before we opened. Within a few days of opening, he started showing up in the parking lot and having conversations with our team. Eventually, he became trusting enough to walk through the courtyard gate and start to hang out. Within a couple of weeks, he was inside the building getting coffee, but still responding strongly to internal stimuli, and at times was misinterpreted by other guests as being outwardly aggressive. A few days later, he seemed as if he was so amped up that he might end up needing to have an OPD or a DCR intervention, but we kept talking to him. The next day, he asked to start back on his medications. He wanted to have a shot. We were able to get him to meet with our intensive case manager and get enrolled in services, and he was very grateful. The next day, he met with our nurse practitioner, and she put in a prescription for an injectable antipsychotic, and we started him that day on an oral antipsychotic. A couple of days later, we were able to pick up his injectable antipsychotic at a local pharmacy, and he was given the injection. He continued to get better each day and started communicating clearly with and showing really good insight into his mental health and his situation. A few weeks later, he got his second dose of inject injectable antipsychotic, and he really started engaging with our team and checked in with us daily. He reported that we were all really saving his life. So that's just one example Very of many good. that yeah. we have. And I've seen many others when I'm down there helping out in yeah. one capacity or another, either volunteering or in an official capacity. So mm -hmm. many times more than that. Else? Thank you. We just don't know how good we've got it when we've got a lot of sad situations out there, and thank you for dealing with those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've been a Sue Beal fan <laughs> since about 2001 or two or three, somewhere way back then. Uh, and the work you do is, is amazingly cool and rewarding, frustrating, as you well know, but very rewarding. One of the biggest battles that we all have is to overcome that is to change people's perception of their stigma that they have of folks with mental illness. Um, and each one of these folks, ladies and gentlemen, have a story, a fact story that we don't know about. But we see them, we judge them, pigeonhole them, and move on. So thank you, Sue, for all the work that you do, all the efforts that Providence does down there, yeah. with all the consortium of, uh, of all the other agencies down there helping out, it's especially great. working with what you're doing, the updates you're doing to uh, address some of the... Uh, Concerns of the business community downtown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Second. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you very much. You bet. Okay. And so um, that leads us into our guest speakers. And so um, I'm going to do the introduction for this one. And it is uh, Mr. Chris Bumgardner. He is from the Washington State of Healthy Drug Systems. Uh, he's the director. And he will present the uh, PMP, or no, AKA known as the Prescription Monitoring Program that relates to prescription drugs, abuse, and its epidemic. Hi, sir. How are you doing there? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Having Again, you I'm back. You did a marvelous job. We had to have you back. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, so um, feel free to ask me questions as I move through the, the presentation. Again, I'm Chris Baumgartner, Drug Systems Director at the Washington State Department of Health, so uh, not too far away from here. And uh, we'll start with a little bit of a 
of an overview. So I always like to talk about, well, why would you need to even monitor uh, prescriptions? And so really it's because we found ourselves in a, in a prescription drug abuse epidemic. And as a lot of my colleagues say, unless you've been living underneath a rock lately, you probably know about the epidemic. But let's move through a few slides here to show what we're talking about today. So this is a nationwide map put out by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, that shows the age-adjusted rates of drug overdose deaths. Uh, Washington used to be a lot darker. We've made a, a lot of good progress. And again, this is all drug overdose deaths. So most drug overdose deaths are caused by opioids. Um, but to compare across the nation, because some uh, states have a harder time tracking individual drug types, we're looking at all drug overdose deaths. In Washington state, the rates of opioid overdose deaths um, break out basically like, like this. You can see from the top line, that's the all drug deaths per year. And the, the next line, you can see that most of our drug deaths, again, like the rest of the country, are caused by opioid drugs. Some of those are prescription opioids, which you see highlighted in the green. We've had about a 30% uh, decline since 2008, 2009. We've had some good progress there. Uh, the challenging part is we're still experiencing about 700 deaths a year annually in Washington state overall due to an increase in heroin-related overdose. Um, unfortunately, they tend to be kind of gateway drugs onto e each other. Whichever one you know, is more readily available to someone, they'll kind of jump to. The last red line you'll see at the bottom is for synthetic opioids. You may have seen or heard of in the news a drug called fentanyl that is becoming uh, a big problem in other uh, states. Uh, thankfully, knock on wood, so far we haven't had too much of a problem here in our state, but we're keeping a careful eye on that. It's being imported a lot um, from China. It's very, very powerful, a lot more powerful than uh, morphine or heroin. And um, as you've probably heard, there's even reports that, you know, so much as just touching it or in inhaling it, you know, uh, law enforcement officers are going down on the scene, for example. And so it's something that uh, we're trying to very carefully watch as well. While it's very easy to get caught up in the drug-related deaths, a part of the epidemic, because that's the most tragic part of it, this really is a public health epidemic and a crisis. From this slide, you can see that it's just the tip of the iceberg when you look at deaths. For uh, the 695 deaths we had in 2014, we also had over 1,500 non-fatal overdoses reported by inpatient hospital stays, over 13,000 admissions for substance abuse disorder treatment, and almost 260,000 Washingtonians annually who report that they non-medically use an opioid or take it in a way that their doctor did not prescribe. And we really see that as kind of the entry point. You know, once you start using it in a way that it was not intended for medically, you know, that's when you can develop opioid use disorder. Another statistic that we've been starting to, to monitor as well, which is uh, really uh, concerning and plays a lot into the other uh, great proclamations that were done earlier at this meeting is neonatal abstinence syndrome. So these are babies that are being born dependent and in withdrawal on opioids because their mothers were abusing these medications while they were pregnant. It, it, it's a really a sad state for, for the family, for the kid, and also obviously adds to medical costs substantially based on the additional medical care these kids will need as they um, deal with that uh, dependence and withdrawal that they're facing. And so you can see that uh, there's been a, a large increase in our state as well for neonatal abstinence syndrome. So a little bit about what the prescription monitoring program is. Really at the heart of the prescription monitoring program, the idea is we can address the prescription side of this epidemic if we provide better information primarily to point of care for healthcare providers when they're treating these patients. If they know what other medications these patients are on and what other healthcare providers are involved with their care, they can make better treatment decisions. So we collect on a daily basis all the prescriptions for controlled substances in our state, and that's about 12 million records a year annually. Again, that's just for controlled substances, and that's just a prescription count. That's not a pill count. So when you think about availability, you know, there's almost one prescription a year for every, every Washingtonian. Uh, we collect, again, all schedules, two through five controlled substances. These are the ones that are legally allowed to be prescribed for different medical conditions. Uh, we also do collect data from veterinarians. Um, this information goes into our state database and then is primarily, again, provided to health care providers so they can make better informed treatment decisions. But is also available for licensing boards as well as law enforcement for investigations they might be conducting. As you can see, we have about 50% of our pharmacists who've registered for an account and a little over 30% of our prescribers. That's something we'd really like to see improve and change, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. 
We do collect uh, data in most cases, but there are some cases where we do not. Uh, if the data, uh, for prescriptions being sold uh, from a wholesale distributor or manufacturer to a pharmacy, we don't see those. If a prescription was issued for 24 hours or less or is being directly administered in a clinic or inpatient setting, those are exempt. Uh, Department of Corrections only reports to us if they release an offender with a dispensing to take home. And obviously federal or tribal run pharmacies don't have to comply with the state law. However, I'm excited to say that our tribal run pharmacies in our state, along with Indian Health Services and the VA, do participate voluntarily in our program. And um, we're hoping to get DOD there as well. Uh, the other area where you'll notice we don't have information is from our opioid treatment programs. Those are methadone clinics. They're um, protected under 42 CFR Part 2. That's the federal confidentiality laws for substance use disorder. And so we don't have that data in our system, but we do encourage our opioid treatment programs to check the PMP so they can at least see are there patients on substance use disorder treatment getting additional medications from uh, the community. Our primary goals for the program are really obviously kind of stated already. We're trying to prevent uh, deaths and unintended consequences from misusing these medications. Um, we also are hoping uh, this will uh, educate the population on the dangers of misusing these medications. Uh, as I like to say, in our society there's an app for that. Does anyone feel like there's a pill for that? There, you just look at the commercials on TV and for about you know, any condition you have, uh, there's a medication out there. And I'm not saying medications are bad. What I am saying is I think we've had a, an amazing a marketing effort to drive up the utilization of these products and we're really getting our heads around the idea of, you know, we need to make sure people realize these are medications you need to take carefully. You don't take an extra one when you've had a bad day. You don't give them to your friend when they've had a bad day. These are very strong medications that need to be taken as your provider has instructed you to take them. So who can we provide this data to? I've talked about this a little bit already, um, but we do provide data to healthcare providers primarily our licensing boards and law enforcement, the Emergency Department Information Exchange or EDI for patients admitted to emergency departments. Individuals can come to the department to receive their own prescription history. We also provide data to three state agencies, the Healthcare Authority for Medicaid clients, uh, Labor and Industries for workers' compensation claimants, and the Department of Corrections for offenders. I'll also share with you today some of our de-identified information which we can make available to anyone really publicly who's interested in using it for prevention or other type of efforts. So a little bit of our data. Uh, these are the top medications dispensed in our state every year for controlled substances. Uh, for those of you familiar with these medications, not surprisingly, the leading category is hydrocodone products. If you've heard of Vicodin, that's what a lot of those prescriptions are for. It's most commonly prescribed for simple acute injuries like uh, teeth extra extractions, for example. Uh, most of the medications you'll see on here are for um, pain relief, oxycodone, tramadol, and uh, morphine, for example. But there's also some ADHD medications that are showing up, uh, methamphetamine, as well as methylphenidate. And then uh, zolpidem is Ambien, that's a sleep aid. And then the uh, AMs, as I like to call them, the lorazepam, those are your benzodiazepine tranquilizers. They're for anti-anxiety medications. So uh, as you can see, these make up the majority of the 11 to 12 million records we collect every year. What we're really looking forward to and trying to increase the use of this program is getting more providers to use it regularly. And so one of our performance metrics we've been looking at is we'd like to see the prescription monitoring program queried or looked at by a provider before every prescription is written for a controlled substance, meaning that at least they've checked it. You can see we're almost at about halfway now. We're really excited about the work we've been doing to integrate this data into electronic medical record systems. This allows the provider to see the information directly in their workflow so they're not having to look at it in a separate web portal system. That's important because providers only have, as often of us have experienced, about 10 to 12 minutes for a patient encounter. And so this gives it to them in their workflow and that's really increased our utilization. I'd like to highlight for you here in uh, Thurston County some of our great new data that we just released. It wasn't available when I pre presented to the, the BHO, but I'm excited to say our new uh, metrics reports are up for accountable communities of health and uh, county level. So this shows the Cascade Pacific um, Action Alliance group, and this is the proportion of the population with at least one opioid prescription during the quarter. So you can actually compare yourself to the other accountable communities of health and look at quarter by quarter over time, are you improving in prescribing practices in your area? Another one I thought I'd highlight for you at a county level, 
This highlights um, the state rate is in black, and you can see this highlights Mason and Thurston County, so our, our neighbor nearby. You can see that Thurston's rate for the number of patients who have concurrent opioids and sedative prescriptions, which puts you at an increased risk for overdose events, is lower than the state rate where Mason's is actually higher. Uh, both are trending down, thankfully, uh, from this at-risk uh, prescribing practice, but we'd like to, consider to continue to see that improve drastically. And so we're really encouraged to provide this to our local health partners as a way to track and monitor your own progress over time in addressing the epidemic locally. Some of our key takeaways we try to really drive home for providers are really, um, you know, you need to check the prescription monitoring program, and these are the key benefits. It really helps you um, see if there's misuse. You can also see if there are additional providers you're not aware of your patient is seeing. You can check for those dangerous drug interactions. Almost all the drug overdose events we have are polydrug deaths. It's not just usually an opioid. It's an opioid and a sedative. It's an opioid and alcohol. It's the combination of these medications that cause respiratory uh, depression and lead to overdose. Uh, you can also use these uh, in treatment contracts as you're working with your patients. And you can uh, check also your own prescription history for your Drug Enforcement Administration number to see if there's any fraudulent use of your, your DEA number. Um, some critical times to check the PMP. Um, we know that, uh, again, with how busy healthcare providers are, they may not be able to check it every time, but we're really encouraging them to consider checking it, especially if they're considering prescribing an opioid, especially for a patient they've never seen before, or if they know the patient is in substance abuse treatment. And based on the neonatal abstinence syndrome data we saw, uh, we really are encouraging anyone who's treating, expecting, uh, who's an expecting mother to really um, consider taking a look at it. As far as uh, ways to integrate this better into your practice, um, providers can delegate access in the system to a registered nurse or a licensed practical nurse or a medical assistant, someone else with a health credential. And so we're really encouraging healthcare providers to consider training up their staff and, and delegating that to them for this type of uh, important work. And also, obviously, if they can integrate it into their electronic health or medical record system, that improves access drastically. Some key resources real quick I wanted to highlight for you. The state of Washington does have a statewide opioid response plan. It's at stopoverdose.org if you haven't taken a look at it. And it follows um, four primary goals that we're focused on. One is obviously preventing new people from developing opioid use disorder in the first place. Second is how do we get more treatment services available for those who do need opioid use disorder treatment. Third, for those who are at, at risk and very high risk for overdose, how do we get Narcan and Naloxone to them, the overdose reversal medication? And finally, how do we use the data in the prescription monitoring program and other data sources to monitor our progress? As you can see, our opioid dashboard is really one of our primary pieces we're going to be using on that. And in addition to the prescription monitoring program data there, we do have death data as well. And we're hoping to add non-fatal uh, non overdose and other data sets as well. Uh, so again, some key resources you might want to look at if you're interested in resources around naloxone or Narcan, uh, stopoverdose.org, run by the University of Washington's Alcohol Drug Abuse Institute, is a great resource for that. For your providers in the county, we would highly encourage them to take a look at the Agency Medical Directors Group Opioid Guideline. It was the first in the country to ever um, put one forward, and I think the CDC mostly uh, stole it from us, so we can kind of pat ourselves on the back there. And uh, it just was updated in 2015 and actually does also include a free continuing medical ed education course for providers on that. If you have any providers in your county who are struggling um, to treat patients who are, um, have a really challenging um, opioid use situation, the University of Washington also offers a weekly telepain didactic they can call into to get technical expertise from uh, pain management experts. And they also have a telepain hotline that can be called. We also know that a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, stockpile these medications in their homes, and we really want to encourage them to get rid of them. A lot of people uh, misuse these medications by, you know, taking it from grandpa and grandma's house, for example. And so if you go to takebackyourmeds.org, which is run by the Washington uh, Pain, or sorry, Poison Control Center, you'll notice all the sites that are available for drug take back. Uh, the really exciting part I wanted to highlight for you is under the legislature this year, a House Bill 1047 uh, passed, which is a Secure Drug Take Back Act. And so this will drastically improve the number of dots on this map very soon. It requires the manufacturers of these medications to create a statewide drug take back program. 
Um, some of you may be aware that Thurston and or, uh, King and Snohomish County have already passed those as local, local ordinances, but this will finally be a statewide initiative. Um, the idea is to have the manufacturers pay for it as a product stewardship initiative, and the drop boxes will be made available at pharmacies, hospitals, and police stations. There also will be a prepaid return mailer option for folks who can't get into one of those locations. Also, it has to be follow environmentally sound disposal options approved by the Environmental Protection Agency. The Department of Health will be responsible for oversight of security, safety, and compliance of the program. And uh, finally, I did want to note as well that the bill, uh, the act sunsets in 2029. So it is time limited, but we're really excited about the, the work our legislature did to get this important piece of uh, legislation through. So keep on the lookout uh, for that. Some of the things we've been doing to improve the prescription monitoring program, one I've highlighted already, and that's really about how do we make this information more easily accessible by our healthcare providers. So this is just a quick diagram to give you an idea about how our integration into electronic medical record systems work. It basically allows um, any type of hospital or pharmacy or clinic um, to have direct access to our state's health information exchange, One Health Port. A great example is our emergency departments. As soon as someone's admitted to an emergency department, those systems automatically send off a request based on, based on just that person being admitted, asking for information from the program and providing it back seamlessly to the healthcare provider. From that, we've seen over 400,000 uh, prescription monitoring requests a month, and we currently have um, five entities actively trading, so our emergency departments, Valley Medical Center in Renton, um, PTSO of Washington, the University of Washington uh, EPIC users, and as well as Cadillac in the Tri-Cities. So we're hoping to continue to do that. Um, the good news for you in Thurston County is Cadillac was the uh, pilot site for Providence, and so we're very hopeful that Providence will come online with their integration soon. They are. Oh, excellent. So I'm very glad to hear that. I think I was hearing good things about that. Um, another piece of legislation I wanted to highlight briefly is House Bill 1427, and this is really important uh, work the department is undertaking with our licensing boards and commissions for healthcare prescribers. It basically will um, develop our guidelines into actual rules that healthcare providers have to follow on opioid prescribing. Our draft rules are now done, and the boards and commissions will look at actually adopting those. If you go to doh.wa.gov slash opioid prescribing, you can look at those. And we're, It'll be really important, it will be very transformative because it will really impact how opioids are prescribed in just about every care setting outside of end of life care, cancer, palliative care situations. And it also expands and does a, a lot of good things for the prescription monitoring program. I wanted to wrap up with just a few quick other points. Um, local health officers were also provided access under that bill. Uh, it allows a county health department local health officer to actually look at prescription monitoring program data to follow up with um, non-fatal or fatal overdose victims and coordinate care with their health care providers. We have a few counties who've uh, been funded to do this already under a CDC grant, including Mason County and Clallam County. And that's something that this uh, bill also authorizes. Another final piece we hope to bring forward from the Department of Health's perspective is what we call a prescriber feedback report. This will allow a prescriber to see how their prescribing stacks up to same license type and specialty. So obviously you don't want to compare an oncologist to a pediatrician, but this will allow them to see across four key metrics of opioid prescribing, how does their prescribing compare and hopefully drive quality improvement. We know the majority of providers are wanting to do the right thing. I think they just need to be brought up to speed on what is the current best practices around prescribing these medications. If any of you have questions or are looking to contact us, you can contact us at the PMP team. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have now, yes. right now. Be prepared. Stand by. All right. Shelly, do you have his number on speed dial? <laughs> you, you, you need his phone number on speed yes. dial. <laughs> Chris is amazing and well respected. In A our very good We're presentation. We're very lucky to have him here. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you, though, on notifiable condition. Mm -hmm. What's the pros and cons? Can you give it to us in a nutshell? Sure. Uh, sure. Why we should or should not do that to see if we can't help alleviate this epidemic. terrible epidemic we're faced right. with. Or gather data. So I'd say the pros of making it a notifiable condition is 
you would be able to have um, better data at the local level about what are the number of fatal and non-fatal um, overdoses that are occurring in Thurston County and give you an opportunity to actually try to do some follow-up care, especially with the non-fatal overdoses. Um, I think some of the challenges are, you know, as, as Dr. Wood has talked to some of her colleagues who have done this, is obviously resources, uh, you know, is a huge challenge. You know, would you have uh, the public health nurses or other staff available to do that follow-up and outreach? And, and also, you know, um, unfortunately, I think because of the stigma that is out there for these folks with opioid use disorder, you know, some of that follow-up could be um, very challenging, you know, to reach out to someone and, and get them to respond and, and look for help. Um, but it is an, an interesting opportunity to, to take a proactive stance. I think another potential pro is getting to um, work with the medical providers in your community who probably don't know that their patients have had these non-fatal overdose events. There was a, a very telling study um, that we looked at where 91% of non-fatal overdose cases, the patient continued to receive opioid medications after the non-fatal overdose event. And it really begs the question, you know, does the provider ever get notified that their patient almost died in the emergency department? I'm guessing most patients don't walk in and say, by the way, I almost died last weekend, just wanted you to know. Yeah. It's, it's because I took too many opioids and, you know, drank a fifth of vodka afterwards, but, you know, I'm good now. They're not going to say that. And so I think it provides um, some potential opportunity there as well. But, yeah, I would say the cons are stigma and, as well as resource challenges. Yeah, but I'd have them going all... Oh. You got until 7 tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have That's why I want him on speed dial. Okay. Uh, yeah, Chris, you mentioned the uh, legislation that uh, would make it mandatory uh, prescription return. Yes. Uh, to pharmaceuticals and whatnot, and also drop-off boxes at the uh, mm -hmm. police stations. Is that something that would be mandatory? So the, the way it works is um, uh, manufacturers must include any qualified pharmacy um, who volunteer to host those services. So it would require um, the local police department to volunteer, but the idea is that the drug manufacturers have to bear all the costs for what it would take for that to be set up as far as setting up the secure drop boxes, doing the, re the proper return to a, a proper incinerator for EPA, um, you know, sanctioned um, destruction of the medications. But yes, this doesn't require the, the local um, hospital or pharmacy or police office to do it. Um, okay. it. But anyone who volunteers to do it, the manufacturer's setup um, system has to basically say, okay, great, you've volunteered to do this. I will provide you the resources you need to make it happen. Okay. Because in Thurston County, we have almost all police uh, law enforcement agencies do that. Correct. With the, with the exception of one. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited about the participation we've had here in, in Thurston County. I think that's been fantastic. Yeah. Does it sound like Olympia is going to sign up on that? I don't know yet. Uh, this is still so new because literally this just passed last month, so um, we still have a, a lot of work to do to, to get this up and running. I believe I did provide the one-pager overview, though, to the, the Board of Health team, so if you want to see kind of the quick synopsis that's available. And we'll certainly be pushing out more as the Department of Health works on our role for um, oversight of security, safety, and compliance. Uh, just a comment, and I'm glad to hear the House Bill 1427 passed as far as yeah. using the licensing process to help yeah. with this overall arching problem. There's many other avenues to be able to do it, but uh, me, that's one place that way you can uh, kind of stop it at the gate, so to speak, or at least help it or assist it in some way. Absolutely. Ways, so. Yeah, the, the, the new rules um, should be effective before hopefully the end of the year. It will probably be late fall before they're effective. The boards and commissions have to go through their process of having their public hearings through the summer and getting those adopted in the fall, but our goal is to have them effective by the end of the calendar year. So, uh, again, um, that'll be a, a huge shift um, yeah. because instead of it being a, hey, hey, doctors, here's a good idea for how you should safely prescribe these, it'll be, yeah. no, this is how you're going to prescribe them or your license will be taken away. And that's so. a critical port. port. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Very good good to see you again, sir. That magnificent brief and um, very professional. We appreciate your Thank you. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the agenda, and we have a very special guest today uh, from the Washington State Department of Agriculture is Dr. Brian Joseph. He is a veterinarian in food safety. We've asked him to come here and give his presentation. We so look forward to it. How are you doing, sir? Very good. It's good to see you. You are a former soldier, or still a soldier, right? Still a soldier, sir. Okay. I'll talk about that briefly. Commissioners, thank you for having me yeah. here and staff. And 
All of you, thank you for what you do for public health. It's, a, it's really challenging our country today, the health issues that we have. Here we are, the wealthiest country on earth, and we have problems that seem almost insurmountable. So thank you all for, for what you do. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, why I'm here in this job and also uh, what we do at the Department of Agriculture. In regard to animal health, it does have a lot to do with public health. So one thing that you all need to know about is um, zombies. I'm, I'm very good <laughs> on zombies. And, and you want to have a veterinarian on your team if we have a zombie apocalypse because veterinarians have some very special skills. You'll have a better chance of surviving if you have a veterinarian because we can provide medical care to people as well as animals. And we can take care of any livestock that you have because you're going to want to have livestock. We can also ensure food safety. If you come across a carcass that a zombie killed a deer, you're going to want to know if that's safe to eat or not. And we can hopefully find a cure. And most of all, we can put up with just about anything. So you'll want us on your team. A little bit about myself. I, I was a very small child when I started irritating people. You can see my father there. And grew up in San Diego around the water and worked at the San Diego Zoo and SeaWorld as a zookeeper before veterinary school. And most of my, my zoo work, uh, most of my veterinary work has been in zoos and aquariums, except for what I've done in the Army and what I've done since I got here. So I'm a very atypical state veterinarian. I always uh, have to show the reason I can do good things, and that's my family. I'm very fortunate to have a, a wonderful family, um, um, a wife that puts up with me, the best wife I've ever had, and uh, two sons. One's a veterinarian. One is a uh, faculty member at University of Colorado on wildlife biology. Daughter-in-law who's... Um, works for Denver counseling kids in the criminal justice system and one who's a nurse. So I'm very lucky to have them and a little granddaughter. I had to show the, the picture of the granddaughter. And the dogs? Um, the dogs, the dogs. So only, it would be excessive to have five dogs. Yeah. So only three of those are mine and two are the, gr two are the grand dogs. That's about, quick calculation, about 475 pounds of doggage right there. <laughs> Not counting the cats. And I do like to collect fish from the ocean the when dog, I can. Yeah. Lovely wife takes care of elephants briefly. She used to own her own <laughs> elephant and traveled with circuses before she got me, and she said the elephant was way easier to train than I am. So I like to put what we do into perspective. It's uh, very easy for us to concentrate just on our world. And because I've had the opportunity to, to travel globally and be involved in a lot of interesting activities, I see the world a little differently than if I lived my whole life here. I was just lucky to be born where I was born. I wasn't born in the United States because I was special. I'm not special. I'm privileged. But I believe all of us have an obligation to think outside our boundaries. So what you see here is a, a map of the world who lives on a, below the poverty level, which is about $1.27, $1.23 per day. And if you look at the blue countries, those are the people who live pretty well. We have, unfortunately, we have more people below the poverty level than China does, which I find a bit embarrassing. But if you look at those other countries, they're all way below the poverty level. Uh, some countries we don't have um, figures on. When I was in Djibouti, about 27% of the people live below the poverty level. But if you look at another, another map, this is a map of uh, armed conflict around the world. We oftentimes get hung up on armed conflict, and we think it's because of religious dogma or some other reason. But those regions of armed conflict are generally where people are poor, where they have uh, nothing to live for. They have no food security. They have no livestock security. There's a lot of corruption that we don't see every day because we have a, a better country. So uh, luckily, I've, I've been in the Army almost 10 years. I was the oldest veterinarian that was ever allowed in the Army Reserve. And that took uh, Ross Perot and two years of being patient. And I've done a deployment in the Middle East with uh, military working dogs and food and water safety and public health. And uh, one in Central Africa with Special Forces. You can see the, the really tough guys down on the bottom left and me. And we were looking for a guy named Joseph Coney, who is the world's number one war criminal. He and his folks are credited with killing about 300,000 people so far. They use child soldiers. And uh, regrettably, our president administration has discontinued that, that mission. During the four years we were there, the killings dropped by 90%. Um, we visited villages that were attacked twice in a week. And people were beaten, raped, everything stolen. It's a very sobering experience. But it's a privilege to do that. And like I said, I do agricultural development work around the world too, which is food security is paramount to having a strong society. So agricultural contribution to Washington's economy is vast. These are somewhat dated numbers. But if you look at um, in 2016, $6.75 billion in food and agriculture products exported 
just export it through Washington ports. That's a big contribution. And about $10.7 billion market value of crops and livestock in 2015. Why is that important? Because one of the reasons that we have the society we do, that we have education, that we have medicine, that we have roads, is because we have a strong agricultural economy. That's a cornerstone of our economy. It's very important that we preserve that. So we do have problems, and uh, one of the reasons that I have a job is because animals get sick just like people do. 2014, 2015, avian influenza. There was an outbreak across the country. Probably some of you hear about avian influenza and you think, well, that's not a big deal. But in 2014, 2015 outbreak, USDA had to pay out about $130 million to producers to depopulate their poultry. That's a big deal. Right now with the current administration, they have no commitment to pay for indemnity. So if someone has avian influenza in their flock, they depopulate it's their loss, and it'll put a lot of people out of business. So why is avian influenza important? And it's important because it impacts trade. That particular outbreak, 18 different trade partners banned poultry products from the United States, and 38 trading partners imposed partial or regional bans. So that's a lot of money, and that impacts our economy very strongly. One of my soapboxes that I'll talk about, and I hope I don't offend too many people, is raw milk. I advise everyone who will listen, do not drink raw milk. If you go back before my lifetime, my parents, their parents, we had very active tuberculosis in the United States from drinking raw milk. Pasteurization put an end to a lot of that. But raw milk, if you drink raw milk, you are about 838.8 times more likely to experience illness, and you're 45.1 times more likely to be hospitalized as a result of that foodborne illness. So please don't drink raw milk. If you do, I'm going to say I told you so. <laughs> and I caution my daughter-in-law, do not drink raw milk. It's one of the issues that we have because in, in Washington, people like raw milk, and they want organic products. And periodically, we find, we find bacteria in that raw milk, and the producers think that we're out to ruin them, and we're not. We're just out, like most of you, to protect public health. So what does animal health do? It doesn't keep T-Rex from playing volleyball. But T-Rex is another one of my favorites. But what we do is we protect and enhance animal health and animal well-being. That's an important part of our issue. We, we promote the economic vitality of the state and the livestock industry by minimizing exposure to animal diseases. And very importantly, and, and I think this is a bigger part of my perspective, is we safeguard human health. Um, I have a very big interest in zoonotic diseases. Uh, and as our population expands, as we move into animal areas, the risk of zoonotic disease is greater. And oftentimes veterinarians are, are fairly well informed about these conditions. So in our state, we have, three, we have uh, three regions, six regions actually. We have field veterinarians in each one of those regions. And they have a big region to, to cover. You can see just looking at, on the right there, Dr. Ben Smith, who also serves on the faculty at WSU. He has a pretty big region of the state to preserve animal health. And they're very busy folks. And our core business is, is animals, animal health, and also um, education outreach. We do a lot of outreach. We will speak to people whenever they want to listen about biosecurity, zoonotic diseases, disease recognition. And we have a reserve vet corps that I'll talk about briefly in a moment. But we do a lot of collaboration, and this is uh, one of my favorite parts of what we do. We work very closely with USDA APHIS, who manages animal health nationwide. We work very closely with their wildlife services people because if a disease gets into wildlife, it can get into our domestic stock. And if it gets into wildlife, such as brucellosis, it's almost impossible to keep it out of our domestic stock for very long. We work a lot with state agencies. Department of Health is one that I have conversations with every week because of animal diseases transferable to people. Work with uh, other states. There's 50 state veterinarians that we have a conference call at least once a week where we talk about national issues. A lot of communication there. Law enforcement, the State Veterinary Association, and also elected officials. Luckily, I don't have to spend a lot of time with the legislature. We have other people that do that that are better suited for it. One of our initiatives is animal disease traceability. We, we protect the public and we protect the industry, but if there is a disease out there in the animal population, we need to trace back where it came from. And so currently we are advocating using RFIDs on livestock so that if an animal is detected with disease at slaughter, 
we can trace back everywhere that animal has been, what animals it was in with. And the point of that is so we can limit the footprint of a disease outbreak. So we can shut a region down so we can tell our trade partners, we've contained this disease, you don't need to ban all of Washington's products, just this particular county or this particular region. We have some pushback from producers because producers on, on the east side believe we have black helicopters and I have drones and I'm out to get them. And I assure them that's not the case, but trust is hard to come by, as, as all of you know. Reserve Veterinary Corps is a very important part of what we do. Dr. Minden Buswell is our coordinator. and We have over 100 veterinarians that are participating. In the event of an emergency, those volunteers will come forward and help us manage issues with animals and people. We're always looking for more people to participate in that. And the emphasis is on the uh, veterinary community, local response, and other animal health professionals. We're very pleased with that. You might remember during the, the um, hurricane in Texas, there were a lot of volunteer veterinarians that were down there working, helping to rescue animals. Part of what I've been doing is restructuring the department. The department was in a, a bit of chaos for when I was in Africa when I applied for the job, and, and for two months I was the only applicant because with 50 state veterinarians, if they know the department's in chaos, not everybody wants to, to buy into that. But I'm a bit of a, a thrill seeker and I'm very comfortable in chaos. And when I returned from Africa, I was living in Winnipeg. I directed a zoo and my wife informed me a week later she was moving back to Gig Harbor November 7th. I could come or I could stay in Canada. She didn't care. So that was a bit of an incentive for me to apply for this job. So we focus on animal health. We focus on animal health, animal disease traceability. Uh, focus on building relationships. Everything happens by relationship. It doesn't happen by law. It doesn't happen by right or wrong. It happens by relationship. And focusing on customer service. Customer service, no matter what your job is, customer service determines if you're successful. So that's a brief overview of what we do. I'd be glad to answer questions. I did run the International Polar Bear <laughs> Conservation <laughs> Center. And I can assure you polar bears will kill you. Thank you for listening. Any, any questions I might... Well, I always pay closer attention to veterinarians. No, this isn't a slam to the medical doctor's profession, but all your patients, you have to figure it out. Your regular medical doctor, you go and they say, well, yeah, my stomach hurts or, you know, whatever. So uh, I know you guys really have to dig into it. Well, there's a confounding variable there, and I actually sympathize with the medical practitioners because most people, when they go to their physician, they give disinformation. They either don't give enough information or they talk about what they saw on the internet and um, they don't always give their doctors the clues they need to. So I sympathize with them. Okay. And their patients can bite also. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Dr. Joseph. A tremendous amount of respect for you. This is the second time I've seen your presentation. It's, I pick up something every time. Well, I rarely say the same thing more than once and I appreciate being here. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I have a, Dr. Wood would like to ask you. Yes, I just wanted to thank you guys. Uh, when I was a brand new health officer in Lewis County in 2007, Dr. Pospisil came and helped us with brucellosis in a puppy mill. Brucellosis is a big deal. I uh, didn't talk about it much here, but if you <laughs> go to some foreign countries, such as when I was in Djibouti, uh, they raise camels and they drink raw camel's milk. And I drank raw camel's milk because we were cultivating an intel source and I couldn't offend her, but maybe 20% of their population is affected by brucellosis, and it results in decreased product productivity, decreased lifespan, endocarditis. It's, it's a bad thing, and it's one of those things, again, like I said, don't drink raw milk. Remember I said that. You heard it here. Anything else I can Is there do? any residual effect from that? From brucellosis? or no, from, from the drinking the raw milk. Uh, well... I, my mental health has always been questionable. So. Yeah, I, I don't think I had store-bought milk until I was about 16. You should seek uh, attention from your physician. <laughs> On that note, thank yes, you so much, sir, for coming in and giving me your brief. It's absolutely uh, intriguing how the world works as far as the veterinarian and um, the animal care and husband's research. So, I appreciate thank you so much. the opportunity. It's all connected. Thank you for yeah. your patience and your time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. We're going to back that up by asking Mr. Sammy Berg, who's part of the Public Health and Social Services, to give a presentation. He has it titled A Tale of Three Closures, and he's going to give a, a background on how Thurston County 
uh, I'll say food inspections and um, restaurant and kind of go along, right? Yes. Okay, you got the floor. All right, thank you for your time. And uh, we're running late, so I'll uh, try to keep it uh, short and sweet. Um, as you can see from the photo, um, I had to look through the internet for a really, you know, captured photo. This is definitely not a Thurston County facility. Um, but out of the thousand uh, permitted f facilities that we run into um, and do routine inspections on, sometimes you do run into a hot mess. And then, well, what do you do about that? And so we're going to talk about three uh, instances of that and what we did and what we're, we're experimenting with to try to improve our ability to help the restaurateur make things better and turn a new leaf. Um, and so the main three things that are directly related to foodborne illness are people working while they're sick, not washing their hands, and then touching the food directly with those dirty hands. Um, and uh, the, the reason that uh, there, we, so there are things that we reiterate all the time when we're doing the, the food inspections and we, we are primarily um, focused on hand washing in particular. That's one of the major ways that we can uh, have food workers prevent illness by keeping their hands clean. And we harp on people all the time about making sure that their hand wash sinks are available, they're not blocked, they don't have a bunch of uh, dishes in them, that there's soap and paper towels, and they can you know, do that effectively. Um, but when we do the inspections and we have issues around those three things, those are also weighted point-wise uh, to be very significant. Um, so, and just to back up a step, we have red points, which are items like not washing your hands, not wiping down that uh, cutting board that had the chicken juice on it, keeping things hot or cold, things that can be directly related to uh, food-borne safety. Um, and then the... Um, the blue items, which are more general sanitation, keeping things clean, keeping things tidy, uh, making sure that you don't have conditions that could potentially lead to uh, red problems. So when we have these problems with uh, these three prime culprits, those are worth 25 red points each. Um, and for comparison, we will have to do a reinspection uh, and come back to your place and actually charge you some money to come back if you exceed 45 points. So any two of these automatically means we have to make a, a re return visit and it's going to cost you $200 for your restaurant because these are significant problems and we don't want to see these problems. Um, and because if you have all three, then you're definitely going to get people sick. And so we want to try to make sure we have overlapping layers of protection between not making, making sure people don't work sick or at least washing their hands and definitely not touching the food. Um, for comparison, out of the 1,000 facilities we look at, about 5 or 6% of the time we have to do those reinspections. And about every year we have to do one or two closures because of various conditions that are going on that are just so out of control that we have to say, wait, you got to you know, pause for a moment here. Let's get this taken care of. Um, most of them are related to uh, equipment failure, uh, sewer backup, uh, walk-in refrigerator that's out of that's not working, and we show up and we say, okay, we need to get this fixed, you need to close until we can get that problem resolved. Usually they're taken care of in a, a day or two or three, and then we get back up and running, make sure that everything's working, and then we, um, we go back into having them be open. Um, sometimes it's when there is a, a problem that's more on the um, behavior side. The staff aren't trained, they don't wash their hands, they're not doing the things that they need to do to keep food safe. And then that's a harder problem to solve as opposed to, you know, just getting a technician to fix a refrigerator. Now you have to retrain your staff. And then you also be actively managing them to make sure that they don't go back into those poor habits. And, and then it's harder also for us to confirm that you've taken those steps and you're going to be on top of it so that a week later we don't have the same problems. So we have, we had three closures all in February of this year, and it kind of highlighted some of these problems, and, and all three were, were primarily related to poor practice. Um, so we had restaurant A, we went there as a new owner. We were there as part of that ownership change to evaluate 
the new restaurant. Hey, what are you doing? How are you making this work? What's your menu going to look like? And as part of that conversation, we found a lot of problems, a lot of violations, over 100 points total that were uh, red points. Um, we also found that the owner just didn't have the knowledge and the experience to know food safety and to be able to make those corrections uh, and, and be able to you know, keep their staff in doing the right procedures and, and, and retrain them. And so we said that they had to close and do a bunch of cleaning, but also do a bunch of retraining. Um, we currently, under Article 2, it prescribes that if we have a situation that we consider to be a, a significant pub public health hazard, we can close the facility down. But it really doesn't speak to what happens next. Uh, for how long? What's the conditions to reopen? Um, it leaves us kind of scrambling each time we have to do this to figure out what's the appropriate response uh, and how to go beyond just the closure. And so we have been talking as a staff and developing uh, a better, a more kind of detailed framework for what happens after that and how do we get them back on track. And we'll talk later with, with you, you gentlemen uh, as a briefing uh, in more detail about those proposals for how to make that work. But part of it is when we want to look at a facility that has behavior problems, how do we make sure that those are fixed? And so what we do now and at, at this location, when all the cleaning and the, the, the equipment was fixed, then we came back in and we had an inspector sit at their restaurant for two hours watching their staff work and wash their hands and keep things clean and put things back in the refrigerator and cook things to the right temperature to really make sure that they understood how that worked, but also to make sure that we knew that the manager had the skills and the knowledge to then keep things on the right track once we left. And so with that in confidence, then we now allowed them to open up their clothes for about a week. Um, restaurant B had um, similar problems when we showed up, lots of violations, over 100 red points. But their owner was knowledgeable um, had been in the business for several years, uh, appeared to have the ability to um, make the changes that we needed to see. And so we gave him a chance, okay, here's the things you need to do. We came back the next day, things were better, uh, saw a lot of good practices, the owner was there. Um, came back the day after that, the owner wasn't there, and things were just back to being terrible. And we said, no, we, we can't flip-flop every time you're not there at the store. You need more management, you need a second in command, you need some backup that can really help make sure that things go well. And so we closed them and allowed them that time to do that cleaning and that retraining, and they did. They, they brought in some additional management staff. They, everyone went through the food handler training. Um, they put some good effort into it, and then we made additional follow-ups to make sure that uh, that went smoothly. Um, the third example was during a routine inspection, after a number of violations were brought forward, the owner and manager decided, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying and I, I haven't done what I need to do. I'm, let me just close now and take care of this stuff and come back, uh, come back when, when I, um, I'm ready and we can, uh, you can reopen me. And that was really encouraging that although these problems should have been addressed earlier, they, they did have the, the presence to just accept that uh, you're right, no, I'm, I'm not going about this the wrong way, I'm not putting the efforts where they need to be for food safety. So let's stop here and um, let me get my acts together, let me get my staff and, you know, all right, and, um, go in the right way and, and come back in a week. And for all three of them, uh, we did that, we worked with them, we, we had staff there and we're, we really try to basically, if we can help them understand the whys, and like certainly what, a lot of what Dr. Joseph was talking about and, and making these connections between, say, raw milk and, you know, there's potential for disease, so we need to keep it cold or we need to pasteurize it or we need to do these things, keep our hands clean. If we help them understand the whys, we'd get better uh, participation and better uh, following of those rules. Um, and just to help them understand that we're not just making these up just because. You know, they're, we, you want your customers to eat good food, we all want them to be healthy and make re repeat visits, so that's what we're here to do. Um, 
and so uh, that's what we're trying to do is um, get them to that point and be a resource, but also be an advocate for the public and confirming that we have confidence that they are going to take the right steps and keep on that road to uh, better public health once we walk out the door. So that's what's happening on the, from the restaurant's perspective. And then we have the public's perspective, which we certainly hear plenty about. Um, uh, some of these things end up in the Olympian, which is great. Uh, it's, a, it's a good way to, to get it out to the public's attention. One problem that happens is that the Olympian, of course, is limited just based on how much page space they, they are able to offer to these things. And so what gets picked to go in there, uh, how delayed it is between the inspection and uh, when it gets reported in the paper, and just how much room they're able to give it um, leads to some confusion. And we've certainly heard um, issues around whether or not it's fair uh, from the restaurant owner's perspective, or sometimes we'll end up with uh, a number of one particular style of menu, like a, a bunch of Asian restaurants come in uh, and, and have poor scores, and, and now we're, you know, we're, we're targeting that, and as opposed to the fact that, well, we did a bunch of other restaurants, those are just the ones that got picked. And that's not uh, a problem, it's just, uh, it unfortunately kind of leads to some perception issues. And so we, we've worked to now have our own web page that directly pr uh, provides the information, the public's able to go there, look up their favorite restaurants, see the last inspection, or just see what the last inspections of the last 90 days were, um, what's going on. One thing we've heard more about, especially since some of these closures, has been a more overt closure notice that, um, hey, this restaurant was closed for these reasons, you know, posted on the website, or and the Olympian certainly offered to say that they'll take, uh, be happy to put any of that uh, as a press release and, and make a, an article out of it. Um, I think there's some merit to that, but we also need to make sure that the other side of that, once we reopen them, also makes as much news or gets as much attention because that's, from, from our perspective, that's a success, uh, is that we found the problem, but now we fixed it. And with the restaurant owner's hard work, and now they're, they're back and open, and can we ensure that those kind of notices uh, get as much attention because it's, it's not a... Uh, not an attempt to say this place gets, got closed and let's, you know, figuratively burn it to the ground because it's, it's not our intent. Um, so there's some, some kind of workings out. We have to play with that to see if we can make that uh, effective and timely and, and work well. Um, we also are looking to do, uh, to follow along with Public Health Seattle King County and their, their uh, restaurant inspection emoticons that you've seen. Uh, in the news where they post it on the window and it's a smiley face or a frowny face or whatnot. Um, that uh, has a lot of merit to being able to provide the customer with direct access to, um, to how they're doing. And we like that. We need to, we're, we're relating King County kind of experiment with it and learn the hard lessons and we'll take the successes from that and then talk with our you know, stakeholders and the Washington Hospitality Association and look to implement that uh, down the road. Um, but that's, that's our presentation. Um, we, like I said, we, in, the f in, in a couple months we'd like to come back and talk more specifically about a proposal to edit uh, and change Article 2 to give us a more definition uh, around our enforcement policies okay. so we can do this. Um, but otherwise, that's our, our tale of closures and what we do. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, Are your visits announced or not? Um, no. No, we do, uh, depending on if it's a, most restaurants get inspected twice a year, and, um, but they're, they're not announced in any, any way. So we'll just come in and we try to hit different times before lunch, before dinner, after breakfast, depending on what they serve and what type of place they are. Um, but we, they're not aware that we're coming. Sammy, one question. Sure. Uh, you see the, the inspections, you do them, and uh, so you see the red violations and the blues, and I don't know, and I'm not asking about who does this, but the reporting to the Olympian, but do you read the Olympian to look at the, the uh, reports to see how accurately they're reported? And the reason I ask is the complaints that I hear are, I can't believe public health said, told this to the Olympian because that didn't happen. 
and they're reading it in, in the paper. So I don't know what's fact or fiction. So um, essentially what the Olympian is, is doing, is, especially since we, um, and it's been a little over a year now that we've been posting our own stuff directly, they basically cut and paste from there and put it into their, their page. Um, depending on how much our inspectors write, and sometimes there are a lot of problems to talk about, um, they may truncate that, but they'll at least give the um, their um, values. And they really are literally cutting and pasting that. So we haven't had uh, those issues. In the past, it had been a more manual process, so occasionally you'll get typos and things like that. And we're always happy to go back and make corrections as needed. Um, but that's uh, that's what's, what's going on now. Um, it's interesting that uh, last week the Olympian had what looked like an extra coverage uh, on Thursday's paper, and they had almost a full page of restaurant inspections, uh, uh, which was nice uh, from my perspective. But um, there, we, and on, on the positive side, we all, we, the public pays a lot of attention to them. We get a lot of comments, yeah. pros and cons, about what they read in the paper. One of the things that we need to do a better job with is the, the perception that we go in there, we write, find a bunch of things that are wrong, and then we walk away. And we're trying to help people understand that, no, we, we fix the problems before we leave. And that's sometimes why we do a closure, because we have no confidence that the problems will stay fixed once we leave the door. And so how do we better communicate that to the public so they have more confidence that when we say it's fixed, it is fixed. And they come that back. must be the issue. But if they're truncating, they're cutting and pasting, they're not leave, telling the whole story. That must be it then. Correct. And literally sometimes there's three or four pages of, of comments that we are putting down on that inspection report. So it is a little challenging for the Olympian to put all that in. Thank you, sir. Sure. You're welcome. Yeah, I know, I know it's not easy, but uh, uh, we thank you. Uh, the whole county thanks you for you and your team, what you do, and the whole department and directorship there because it's a balance. of And um, where do you put that fulcrum as far as getting that balance in terms of health versus uh, um, business? and. Uh, I, I don't know if I could do your job. I mean, you know, <laughs> well, so yeah, I like I like what you do, though. So. Well, we appreciate, it. and we, we definitely do recognize we have a, a thousand businesses that we're trying to assist, but we also have a quarter million people that live in the county, million, um, exactly. and that that is a balancing point between the the two of them. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's great to see you again. Come on back, and we'll talk about Article Two. Okay. Exactly. Appreciate your time. Thank well, you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, we have one more department, department item, and it is uh, um, uh, Patrick Soderberg and <laughs> Timothy Wilson and Art Starry, and it's Aquatic Nuisance Weeds Control, and I think Art's going to start us off. I'm going to start it out. We did a quick change here on the programming. Okay. Uh, so I'm Art Starry. I'm the Environmental Health Division Director for Thurston County Public Health and Social Services, and we're here to review uh, or actually ask you to consider approving an aquatic nuisance weed control prescription for Lawrence Lake. Um, also here today, and uh, I'll turn it over to him shortly, is Tim Wilson, who's the, the Lakes and Noxious Weeds Manager for the Public Works Department. And so he's worked to develop the prescription, and we'll give you a little bit of information about that. And then also, if there are any questions, is Patrick Soderberg, and he, he's a hazardous waste specialist, but he also is our Pest and Vegetation Management Coordinator, I think is the official title that he has. And so what's, what this is, is the, it's a following through on a policy that's actually been in place for a number of years in Thurston County. And uh, way back in 1989, the Thurston County Commissioners adopted the pest and, uh, pesticide use policy. And then that got modified a couple of times and became the pest and vegetation management policy. That, was, that happened in 1993, and then it was recently updated in 2014. And what that says is that uh, when, when there's a proposal to use pesticides, and that's something that can kill weeds or bugs or, or can other types of controls on county properties or properties that the county manages, which is in this case is a lake where the, the, it's a privately owned lake, but the county is managing the weeds on there on behalf of the citizens. Uh, there needs to be a prescription or a plan that talks about how those are going to be done. That is, ends up being reviewed by, there's something called the Pest and Vegetation Management Committee, and those are actually some interested citizens, and actually quite a few of them have quite a bit of expertise on this, to help review it and make sure that it's a good proposal. And then, uh, then, then that ends up being adopted by the Board of Commissioners. Uh, in this particular case, because it's a lake, the, the vegetation or the aquatic weed prescription uh, needs to come before the Board of Health for review and approval. So what's happened is that it was developed by uh, Tim with the assistance of staff. 
Uh, it was brought to, to Patrick and the Pest and Vegetation Management Advisory Committee. They reviewed it, and now they're recommending that it be approved by the Board of Health to help manage uh, the noxious weeds that are on Lawrence Lake. Um, and as the Board of Health, you have that responsibility. It's probably, you probably didn't know that when you ran for county commissioners, but you're on the Board of Health, and one of the things you get to do is, is review these prescriptions. And the things, the tests that you do or the criteria that you need to use when you evaluate this is, to, is, is what's adopted in the policy. And it says that you need to, the pest and vegetation problem has been assessed and the control is deemed necessary, so that's one of the things you get to, to look at. The use of the pesticide is a necessary element of the, 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 the integrated pest and management prescription and that um, the risk to public health, groundwater, and the environment is deemed to be minimal. And so those are the things that you actually, in your policy that was adopted, you're supposed to do. And, and again, staff and the Pest and Vegetation Management Committee have reviewed this and they think that, yeah, that, that's probably, a, that, that meets this test, but ultimately as the elected officials, you get to make that decision. Uh, so that's just the, the kind of the preliminary comments. I'll turn things now over to Tim. Tim can tell you a bit about the prescription and what it's intended to do. And uh, then if they have any questions, Tim and Patrick and I will do our best to answer them. Good afternoon. So uh, from, a, from a lake management perspective, what this prescription does is basically adds another tool to the toolbox for weed management uh, within the lakes. Um, we've had primarily one uh, herbicide, aquatic herbicide, that we've used for a number of years on Lake Lawrence. And um, the problem with that, both with terrestrial applications and aquatic applications, is over time uh, the, the plants or weeds you're trying to manage can, can develop a certain amount of resistance. And uh, the other factor is uh, they may do very well in controlling this that species, but another species that's uh, also undesirable may move in, which is called weed shift. So what, what this is, allows is for us to use a different herbicide with a different mode of action, rotate them through uh, to, uh, uh, to stop those two scenarios from happening. So uh, this prescription is very similar to the prescription that you guys saw uh, and approved last year for Long Lake. Uh, it adds uh, an herbicide called, called Aquathol. Uh, it's been, uh, this was on the uh, um, work plan for the Lake Management District and the steering committee. They are aware of it and in support of it as well. And I would ask that you uh, uh, consider it and approve it. I have a couple questions. The state or I don't know, who, who regulates you folks, but this is also okayed by other regulatory bodies that like Department of Ecology or Agriculture, whomever. So it, it meets all of those requirements? That's correct. And, and is it in fact used by other jurisdictions, possibly city, county, state, municipal, whatever? Yes, it's, it's an approved aquatic herbicide within Washington State. It's been uh, vetted by the Department of Ecology and uh, approved under our ecology permit that we operate under for uh, management of both Long Lake and Lake Lawrence. And this is the additional tools that we need to do a better job? That's correct. That okay. No, no, we had a good discussion uh, on this topic earlier. Okay, I'm looking for a motion to approve. I move to approve the aquatic nuisance weed control prescription for Lawrence Lake. Second. We move the second as stated. All those in favor say aye. 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 And motion carries. Thank, thank you, Thank Jim. you, sir. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you, Shelley. Which brings me to the next point as far as the director's report. And I think Shelley's got the floor for this one. Thank you, Commissioners. I know we're running a little bit short on right. time. So Take your time. We want to hear it brief as possible, but um, I just want to say thank you again to everybody that is uh, that was here today and presented. Um, I think this was a fabulous uh, Board of Health meeting, a way to kick off Public Health Month um, with all the amazing things that we heard today that really give a good snapshot of the broad scope of responsibility that we have in public health, from food safety to preventing overdose deaths to preventing sexual violence, tracking data. It takes us doing a lot of data and follow-up protecting kids from child abuse and neglect, supporting Thurston Thrives, and you heard a little bit about how innovative that effort is, how we partnered with business and community members to promote the social determinants of health, 
um, protecting our lakes and environment. Um, we even got to hear about zoonotics uh, from Dr. Joseph, and uh, Sammy even does a little bit of that as well in his, in his job. So, um, so it's never a dull moment for us in public health, so we always have lots of great things to share, um, and it takes all of us uh, working together to achieve the highest health and well-being for everyone in Thurston County. So with that, uh, you heard a little bit of our great news that we had last month about our county health rankings. Yes, so the Robert Wood Johnson, Johnson Foundation um, does rankings of every county in, in the nation um, and looks at uh, how we rank within the state of Washington. And you heard last month and also in a, in a press release uh, that went out and was uh, was uh, in the Olympian and Thurston Talks and some other local publications that were number six healthiest in the state of Washington. We're really, really proud of that. Um, but another uh, kind of late breaking, a bit of uh, news that we heard um, through the Aetna Foundation and the US News and World Report um, shows Thurston County is in the top 500 counties in the entire nation. So that's the top 8%. Um, there's nearly 3,000 counties um, in the country. There's, uh, that's about 95% of all the counties. They're not quite entirely done with, uh, with all of that. Um, but our own Chris Hawkins was on the panel with U.S. News and World Report and Aetna Foundation earlier this week. And um, I just think it's something for us to be really proud of. Um, and a big part of that is uh, due to our, I think, our focus on social, the importance of social determinants and all the great work that we're always doing in public health. So um, with that, we continue to work on additional areas of improvement that we have, especially around equity. There's several other areas. We continue to work with our partners um, on Thurston Thrives uh, to achieve collective impact. Uh, earlier this month, um, we had a Thurston Thrives Action Team Summit in which all the action teams came together. Um, we had a wonderful strategic session um, about focus areas for us moving forward, how can we can further move the needle. Um, emerging areas of interest were housing. I know your favorite action team, sir, and, um, and the education resiliency and action team that you got to hear a little bit from earlier and, and the efforts that they're doing to improve the lives of children in our community. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, it was also really great to hear um, from Chris Baumgartner today. Uh, we are taking the opioid epidemic very seriously. Uh, I'm very glad to uh, support Thurston County making the decision to um, file a lawsuit against the makers of OxyContin, and we're exploring other ways in which we can prevent opioid misuse, overdoses, and death in our community within our department, um, and how we can coordinate with um, the governor's uh, opioid response plan that Chris spoke of, and also align with Cascade Pacific Action Alliances which is our accountable community of health that Chris also shared that, that map of and how, how we compare. So we're looking at doing a Thurston County um, opioid response work group, and we're going to have our first meeting coming up on May 9th. So I'll be coming back to continually update you on what we're doing for uh, the opioid epidemic in our community. Of course, we want to prevent substance use disorders before they happen, and that starts oftentimes with youth. Um, so earlier at your Board of County Commissioners meeting, uh, you approved a new contract that we have with the Washington State Department of Behavioral Health Resources, <laughs> DBHR. Um, and uh, so that will allow us uh, to serve as the coalition coordinator for the BCOTA Tonino Healthy Action Team. And that's part of a community prevention and wellness initiative. And um, this is going to support our work in rural Thurston County um, communities to work on substance use prevention for youth. So that's really good news. And some not as good news, uh, we got the results back from our, th our Thurston County point in time homeless count. Um, that was conducted back in January. We contracted with the city of Olympia and um, engaged with hundreds of other volunteers, including all of you here who participated uh, in supporting that count and, um, that we, and various uh, support services that were provided throughout the county to serve those without housing um, and to really better assess and get a snapshot of, of uh, 
what our numbers are. And the results that we have received are quite alarming. So uh, 828 uh, people were identified as homeless in our community. That um, is up 43% from last year's count. Um, we also had 324 unsheltered that, uh, were, that were officially counted. Um, we know that there's probably about triple the number um, living in many areas of our, of our community. Um, and that number of 324 itself um, is triple. So substantial increase in those that are unsheltered. Our shelters on that day were at 110% capacity, so our shelters are operating at maximum capacity. So we have to work together to find new, um, new solutions, um, work together as a region, and um, identify ways in which we can make um, more supportive housing and other types of housing affordable for, for those in our community. Uh, and you heard a little bit about some of that impact when um, Sue Bill was here from, Pro um, from Providence Community Care Center, and I was really glad that, that she came and gave us that update, and I think she'll be coming back again to share a little bit, little bit more and expand on that issue further. Uh, in uh, in investigation of disease control and prevention, uh, influenza, the flu, um, continues here in Thurston County in the state, but is, we are starting to see some decrease. Uh, cases in Thurston County have leveled off, leveled off with 20 to 25% of the individuals tested um, through our hospital um, surveillance system testing positive for influenza A or B. Um, influenza B is the predominant strain right now. Thurston County um, did unfortunately have two in influenza deaths um, in the month of March in Thurston County. So, but we're, we're glad that that, uh, that is decreasing. Uh, in other news, you saw our amazing um, maternal health child, our maternal health child nurses, nurse family partnership. We're here. Um, they're doing great work uh, in all three counties. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to expand to also serve Mason and Lewis counties, which you've heard about before. And so um, our team delivered 329 visits to mothers and babies in just the last month. So that is an incredible amount. Those efforts are being recognized, not just at a state level, not, um, but also at a national level. So we are one of just a handful of programs selected by the national office to receive incentive grant fundings to ex further expand this regional partnership. It's another way in which Thurston County is really shining in this area, and we're really proud of that. Um, I'll share more about that in the future, that, that grant. Um, is contingent upon us receiving some other funds, um, but we're really hoping to be able to further expand because the demand um, for that amazing program that really makes an incredible difference, and especially in preventing child abuse and neglect and providing support um, to parents and reducing adverse childhood experiences. So really happy about that. Uh, um, in our vital records, a, a lot of people don't know that we do births and death certificates at our Lily Road facility. So um, we did 422 birth certificates and 921 death certificates this last month um, by our amazing admin team, serves the public uh, every day with that. Um, we are seeing big increases, um, not only because it is kindergarten registration time, but also because um, many people are aware that there are new state regulations for travel effective in October, so people have to have um, enhanced driver's license in order to fly on a plane in October. And so they need to have their birth certificate in order to achieve that. So we really encourage um, the public to, um, to not wait till October. If, if you have travel plans, then come on in. We're always um, happy to help, uh, help any member of the public if they have any question about any of the programs that have been featured today. Um, we're always happy to help at 412 Lily Road. And you can also visit our, our website. Thank you. <laughs> At the point in time, uh, the the numbers are in, but I, I understand the uh, the analysis and the demographics are coming out next month. Yes, that's right. We'll have more information in May to be able to break that down in more in more detail. Uh, we re we enter that information into what's called the Homeless Management Information System, and that is certified by the Washington State Department of Commerce and HUD. And then we'll be able to dive a lot more into, into details that can tell us a little bit more about some of the trends or some of the focus areas and populations um, affected. And the uh, over-the-top fantastic news about Thurston County and uh, awards and ratings and grants, has that been in our newspaper of record? 
Um, yes, uh, that was featured in the Olympian, our county health rankings of number six. This new one has not yet. Um, I, I think it will be uh, featured in National News and U.S. News and World Report. I would expect that they will cover that in some way. Not sure if that'll be uh, via, via the web or, or yeah. via print, but we'll be getting more information about that because that's really good news to share and, and keeping our eye on um, continuing to improve, improve on those other areas. Good. We can only hope. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, we, uh, a lot of great stuff items that you've covered there and since the last 30 days we've met and I just think it's phenomenal how your leadership and the staff leadership has been there on the front line of keeping this county he healthy and I'll even cite uh, a quarter million people. That's not easy every day and uh, every hour, every night to make sure um, people have help not only individually and as a community as a whole. But I want to go back to the uh, statistic. Uh, it was forever in seventh place, and I was waiting the day one of the <laughs> office, and I'm so happy. I'll take six. I want more, obviously, but it is forever, and we thank you so much for being there and making that happen. It's not just a number. There's a lot behind that number. I know that. You go look on the, the criteria and everything, but it just gives us uh, a really good um, notion that we can be better every day, and we just put our heads and minds to it, and I thank you so much. We thank you so much. So. Thank you. You Thank you, yeah. everyone, and... Um, Public Health and Social Services that yeah. does this every day. Okay, this is here from the doctor. It's the doctor here. Well, uh, tuberculosis continues. It's a uh, slow and steady march. Um, we continue to do directly observed therapy on three individuals, one of whom we had to stop therapy for a while because of side effects from the medication. And um, on a, another uh, front, emergency preparedness, we will be um, our team here at the health department is hosting uh, a really, well, I think it's cool day, um, uh, April 26th, I believe is a Thursday. We will be partnering with regional partners in um, uh, exercise on Ebola and other special pathogens. So um, I'm looking forward to that. And that's it. Any questions for Dr. I have a, just a quick question. I don't want to cause any fear and panic, nor do I want to violate HIPAA, but the, the TB cases, were they involved in our jail or law enforcement at all? Good. <laughs> Thank, Thank, you. You. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. With that in mind, is there any questions or comments from anybody? Romero, anybody? Shall they go back to you? All righty. Is there a motion to adjourn uh, Board of Health for April 10th? Yes, I move that we adjourn the uh, Board of Health meeting for April 10, 2018. Second. It's been moved a second to adjourn. We are adjourned.